February of 1996. My wife is told to go to a high-tech, high-resolution sonogram. Now, because we had twins, we had eight children, but there were seg seven pregnancies. I had been a part of each one of those going to the checkups, and they would always show the sonogram. I could never tell anything in those sonograms. It was always so grainy to me. But my wife was always enthusiastic. Oh, did you see the hand or the foot? I, I didn't want to tell her I couldn't see anything. I just looked like grain. But this was a different kind of sonogram. This was a high precision sonogram that even I could see. And as the doctor put his wand on my wife's stomach, and the projection on the wall showed what was seen, even I could tell something wasn't right. Because you could see the heart chamber, and you could see flapping. Just didn't look right to me. The doctor turned off the sonogram machine and turned to Misty, my wife, and I, and said, I, I have some bad news for you. He said, as I look at your child, there are a number of symptoms to tell me that this child has Down syndrome. But actually, more serious is, is that he has what we call a hole in the heart. The valves aren't formed properly. The heart's not functioning properly. And at some point, this child's going to need open heart surgery to survive. Kind of rocks your world. The pregnancy was difficult for my wife. I still had to leave. Then our son Daniel, and Kyle if you'll put that up. Our son Daniel is born on August 5th, 1996. He would spend the first three weeks of his life in the pediatric intensive care unit. I didn't even know there was one of those. Affectionately called the PICU. Three weeks. And Misty and I had made a commitment that one of the two of us were going to be at his side at all times. I still had the lead. And then uh, Daniel would have two heart procedures, five different extended stays in the pediatric intensive care unit, open heart surgery, and a final two weeks in the pediatric intensive care unit. And Daniel would die on April 30th, 1997, the age of about nine months. Wow. That was all going on while I was leading OCF, leading a Marine Corps Reserve Squadron, and leading my family. So I'd like to share something with you. Kyle, if you'd put the next one up. What I experienced what I learned and how I changed. Because I found there's not a lot written on this. There's some, but not a lot. It's not necessarily talked about a lot when we talk about leadership. There's a lot of books written about leading in the midst of an organizational crisis. But to be truthful, it's going to be more common to have to lead in your own personal storm because you'll find that as part of life. So I did learn a couple of things. This is what I felt. I felt fatigue. No, no one told me what to expect as I was doing this, trying to lead while in the midst of a storm. I was so tired. And I had been on contingency operations. I had been overseas, all those kinds of things. I had never been so tired. We would have to feed Daniel about every two or three hours when he was home because he could only eat a little bit at a time, but he needed to keep his strength up. Two to three hours a night, night after night after night, after, and then having turns when he would be in the pediatric intensive care unit. I was so tired. Second of all, I was angry. No one told me I would be angry, but I was. I kept asking why. why. Why is this happening? Why Daniel? Why now? Why, 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 why? And I hate to admit this, but I'm going to admit it. 
It's the only time in my life that I've punched a wall. But I did. And it was stupid. Because now, not only was I tired and angry, I had a hurt hand that I didn't want to tell anybody about because I was embarrassed that I would be that angry to hit a wall. But I was. I felt fear of failure. I just wasn't sure I was going to be able to pull it off. And I felt a numbness that I can't even explain. I would sit down to do something that was routine. I just couldn't do it. Part of it was being tired, but there was something else that was going on. I was just numb. I'd never found it in my leadership books. No one had told me about this at the Naval Academy. Nobody had told me about this at the basic school in the Marine Corps. Nobody had prepared me for those set of feelings while I was trying to lead. Now, I think those feelings tend to come in general with those kinds of crises that we face personally, but they are intensified when we're still trying to lead. So what did I learn? One of the things I learned is, is the importance of trust. I had to build trust, unbeknownst to me, very quickly in two of those three organizations, OCF and my Marine Corps Reserve Squadron. The trust that was built in that short period of time before Daniel allowed me to give things to my subordinates and to also go and tend to some things that I needed to and not be around the office as much as I would normally be, but they trusted me. Some of that trust I've now learned actually was built before I ever got to that place because of a professional reputation. You will establish your professional reputation very early on. Make no mistake, it is critical so when these times come, the trust is partially built just on your reputation, let alone on the leadership that you start to demonstrate to other people. I went to a retirement ceremony down at Quantico last Friday. The person who was retiring worked for me at one time. And there's something he said in his retirement speech that caught me, and I say this humbly. But what he said is, he said, our new executive officer was showing up. This actually took place after Daniel's death. He said, our new executive officer showed up. His name was Art Athens. I had already heard all about him, and I knew we were in good hands. How did he know that? He knew it because of what I had done before that moment. And so when you step in, you can fail and destroy that reputation at any moment. But if you keep it going, it builds the trust that's necessary when you have to lead an organization differently than you would on a day-to-day -day basis. You had to be able to trust people to give them things you would normally do. They had to trust you that even if you weren't there all the time, it was okay. And when the big decisions had to be made, you would roll in and help with those. What I didn't realize is, is how much it developed my own staff at both OCF and at the Marine Corps Reserve Squadron. Because people had to pick up the load. And they learned, and they grew, and they developed. It's taught me how important that is just in the normal day-to-day -day life, to give people opportunities to grow. And within my own family, our children had to take on a lot more than they ever had before. And I think their success today, the older ones, is very much attributed to that period of time. So I learned how important trust was. I learned how important transparency was. The power of transparency. The worst thing you can do when you're facing a personal crisis as a leader is to keep it all to yourself. Now, there are minor things that happen in our life. I don't recommend coming every five minutes to your people and saying, oh, let me tell you the latest hurt I have or the latest problem I have. But if it's something significant like we had, you'd better tell people what's going on. They want to know. They want to know because they're a little afraid. 
They want to know because they actually care. And the worst thing you can do is shut off all the communications. So I would tell our people what was happening. I also learned the futility of asking why. It's a waste of time. And it's the most common direction we take when we are leading and facing a personal storm. It's a waste of time. You won't know why. I know sometimes people say, oh, you can look back and really understand some of these things. I'm going to tell you, I've been through a lot of things in my life. You still can't piece it all together exactly. Don't try. So I learned the importance of trust. I learned the power of transparency. And I learned the futility of asking why. So how did I change through this? I became a much more humble leader. I think before Daniel, I was much too full of myself. My good friend, Will Costantini, who was here yesterday, who's a true American hero, but is a very humble one, said it best. It's not about me. Daniel, that little baby, helped to teach me that it wasn't about me. My wife and I read a book called Angels Unaware, written by Will Rogers and Dale Evans, probably much before your time, but two very prominent people in the probably 40s and 50s who had a down child who died at an early age. And this book is written from the perspective of the child that's how it's narrated in the book. And one of the things...